Um, I'm Carsten Yorkshire, I'm Creative Director at McCann New York and co-creator of Generation Lockdown. Um, I came over to um, America about three years ago with Alex, um, my creative partner, um, to work at McCann. And this is, uh, you know, one of the great projects that we've that we've done there and, and like a personal highlight for me, for sure. So Alex Little, creative director on the project. Um, yeah, also came over with Carsten from Australia about three years ago. Um, so it was a bit of a, it was a good kind of welcome to America, dive straight into their biggest, one of their biggest issues, gun violence. Um, and agree with Carsten, one of the best projects we've worked on. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Levy. I'm a producer at McCann. Um, I actually have also been at McCann for about three years and I'm from South Florida, um, specifically the Parkland area. And I went to school at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, which is part of the part of the connection that McCann has to the March for Our Lives students. Uh, I'm John McAdory. I'm an executive producer at McCann. I came, well, came over to McCann from uh, Martin, New York about four years ago. Uh, so, um, and my brother is the lacrosse coach at Stoneman Douglas. And once uh, I heard about the opportunity to work on this from the rest of the team, I, I couldn't be stopped from working on it. It was important. Uh, what it came to be is um, a, a, a two minute film that we released online, um, which captured the kind of raw truth of what American kids learn at school. Um, there'd always been rumors and, and talk of the kind of lessons kids learn in preparation for an active shooter, but no one had laid out those steps in detail. Um, so we created a film and, and did it in a way that we think would, um, would make people wake up and, and do something about it. Get down, get down. Get down. Get of children practice lockdown drills. We're gonna bring in a special guest. She's an expert on this. She's going to be leading our team building event. Oh, Kaylee. There was an active shooter. You would all be dead. When you talk out loud, make sure you can tell where you are and where you're hiding. You can try and protect your friends by pushing the tables against the doors. You can't cry. It gives away your hiding spot. And if you're in the bathrooms, you have to stand on the toilet seat so they don't know that you're in there. That's crazy. Try to listen for things that could help the police. If you hear a lot of bangs like, bang, 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 the shooter might be down the hall. We need to create change in this country. We need to actually be changing the laws and making sure that our people are safe. I'm frankly pissed. I don't know about the parents at home who are watching this for the first time, but it was very unsettling. So this. It hit me in the gut. I think we're traumatizing the whole generation of children. Upon being elected, I will give the United States Congress 100 days to pass reasonable gun safety laws. And if they fail to do it, then I will take executive action. Lockdown, lockdown, let's all hide. Lock the doors and stay inside. Well, the idea, the idea for the project actually came from um, a, a drill that we had at McCann in the office that we all attended. Um, as Alex mentioned, you know, we came from Australia and before this kind of came about at all, we, we were kind of st still grappling with the intensity of the, of the problem and, um, you know, exactly what school children face every single day and how it's just kind of almost become a reality for um, Americans to deal with and almost like second nature that that's just part of what happens at school. So we were already kind of thinking about that top of mind and we had a fire drill at McCann um, 
which we thought was just a regular fire drill. Everyone kind of congregates in a common area in a fire ward and kind of goes through the motions of what you do when there's a fire. But unlike the ones we're used to having in Australia, at the end of the fire section, he kind of moved into the shooting drill section, which we kind of had never experienced before and was kind of shocking. But to be honest, we kind of looked around and, and most of the kind of locals or the Americans were they feel like they've heard it a little bit of it before and you know they're a little bit more used to the reality of that that might happen um and we just remember kind of thinking like well wow, like i can't believe that this isn't more shocking i think that was the first time the reality hit that this has just become kind of ingrained um in people's minds and in, in the in the psyche and that's kind of where the kind of the kernel of the idea started to form um we we just kind of it kind of stuck with us and we kept thinking about it and at one point we just went like what would make people really pay attention because at its core it's a really shocking thing that's being said but it's become normalized to the point where um it's not sinking in and at one point um we were just like i mean the real I mean, that guy was great, the fire warden, but it seems like he's going through the motions, whereas somebody that's living this every day is a child. And if a child had have given that little, you know, one minute drill at McCann, everybody would have been paying attention. And that's kind of where it all started. And we just kind of took it from there. Um, so McCann has had a, a relationship with March for Our Lives for the past few years. And um this is our this uh, generation lockdown was our third project with them so it was a pretty seamless um plan once this idea you know started evolving into something substantial that we could move forward produce and create to work with march for our lives so um we pitched you know um, as we do we pitched them the idea and there was a little bit of communication back and forth about things that had to be tweaked I know that we worked really hard on making sure that it was a universal drill, even though the drills vary state to state. So we definitely worked with them. And that was the benefit of that organization, their knowledge. We worked with them to make sure that what we were including was accurate. Mm -hmm. And we also wanted to make sure that anything we discussed relating to guns themselves was factual, which though we're all activists in this space, I think it's fair to say none of us are gun experts. So there were definitely a few things that we ended up having to tweak that we got wrong initially. Um, and it was, it was, it was definitely, they played a huge role in us developing it into what it finally became. Though these guys really just let, you know, put together an incredible piece to, to jump off from. We have a very good relationship with Brian Buckley, who's a fantastic director. He's done a lot of work with us uh, on Verizon. He's actually, doing some tremendous work with the Trump Statue Initiative right now. Um, and we started, we talked to him, we got him on board. Um, the hardest thing for us um, came down to what company was gonna let us film the drill. Um, because it's a big statement to make as a company and to have your name out there. And when I tell you that it was six months of going through all of our LinkedIn's <laughs> and just reaching out to anyone. Alex was talking to neighbors uh, and, and friends in the, in the neighborhood. I reached out to, um, I remember being at a, a Christmas party with a friend of mine and somebody came in and he's like, oh yeah, I own you know this company and I won't name it. Um, and uh, sure, I'm totally down and I'll help you guys out. And then crickets and, and he ghosted me. Um, so it was, it was tough to find someone that would take a stand. Um, and eventually we did wind up with this great company in San Diego of all places. And it was a nationwide search. I mean, we, if whoever had said yes, we were going to go there. Uh, and they very graciously let us, uh, let us work out of there. And then, and then finding Kaylee was, was that oh. stroke of luck, which, which um, brought the whole piece together. Kaylee, the lead, the lead girl, I don't want to say actress because she, she has no acting experience and is not a professional actor. She's a child who's, who's experienced this um, firsthand. She is everything you think of when you see her. Um, there is no one I don't think I've ever worked with more authentic. And that's part of what was so gripping and gut-wrenching about her. Um, when, 
while simultaneously kind of while Mac was working um, for six months, it wasn't quite that long of a search. We actually had to turn it around quickly. But around that time, while he was working on locations, we were trying to find who this lesson leader would be. And it was a little dependent on where the location ended up being. But we had a pretty good feeling that it would be in California. And we reached out to March for Our Lives, our partner, and asked to be connected to their local California chapters. And then we reached out to those chapters and said, do you have any activists that have younger siblings? Because we knew we wanted to hit, we wanted to hit the age range that was um, authentic for these types of lessons. Obviously, we didn't want to traumatize young kids by giving them information they weren't already being taught. But we did want to get that lower appropriate age range to make sure people saw how awful it was. So we were thinking of someone's sibling. And then they said to us, we actually have this incredible young activist herself who joined March for Our Lives because she was traumatized from these active shooter drills in school. And it kind of spiraled from there. We got a video of her. She was, I believe, in a bookstore. Um, her grandma sent over a video of her introducing herself, talking about why she was involved in being an activist. And uh, we all kind of fell in love from there. She was amazing, but it was, it was a little bit of a network to find, to find her and connect um, her to this project. And she's just phenomenal. Uh, the fact that she steps into that room and really, really found just just owned it uh, in, in the performance that she was able to give, which was from the heart. But it, it, it was really inspiring to see. And that's a testament to Brian working with her and just her, uh, her love for the, the whole movement, which is fantastic. Yeah, totally. And a testament to um the fact that this is so real like when like she wasn't an actor she couldn't practice in front of anybody obviously because we had one kind of opportunity to get it massive pressure for somebody that you know hasn't done anything like this before but i think it's a testament to the fact that all of it's real everything she says is real she didn't have to really act she just kind of she knew it was a serious issue so she knew obviously like it's nothing funny about it so that's kind of where a kind of tone comes from and she just kind of came out and, and delivered it and honestly she added bits and pieces that like we didn't even know about um like on the day because she's she she just kind of got into it and you know obviously the things that she was traumatized by the most kind of came to light and she explained them too and after the the kind of you know the part that we had planned and finished everybody obviously stood around pretty shocked because it was like a hidden camera kind of thing and the weirdest thing happened like all the audience sort of people at the um the workers in there at the at the at the office like just started picking her brain and she just kept talking to them for ages afterwards about like in detail exactly what happens and that was almost like more moving than than the actual you know um, script, not script, but you know, the, her original performance it was really cool to see. I think we were all just holding our breath. Anyone who's shot one of these um, kind of activations where it's all about one take, um, everyone's just on, on, on their toes, hoping it goes well. Um, and then as she came out and just nailed her performance it was just silence you could hear a pin drop um yeah. the cast and crew who were all doing it for free everyone kind of did this out of the love of their hearts everyone was kind of crying behind behind the camera um despite the fact we had all read the performance and had an idea of what she was about to say um seeing it for real um was was really really heavy um so yeah, that was that was what it was like behind the camera. Obviously, that's what we wanted, and we felt we felt good after it because we had been moved, and we we felt like we could we could move some people around the country if they see the same thing. Um, but yeah, it was it was an intense situation for sure. The next big challenge for us was uh, when we got into edit. Um, our editorial team over at Number Six they came up with the idea of building the skills into the whole um, message, and the next part of that was finding the right stills and then clearing them because we have to be airtight uh, for something like March for Our Lives um, because the last thing we want to do is expose them to any kind of risk. 
Uh, so it was a matter of going through those stills and reaching out to the people that were in them and getting their permission to use them in the spot. Um, and that became a whole other challenge because it was using every bit of our social networks. Um, you know, Gabby's connections to Parkland, um, everybody that we all knew on Facebook, uh, and just looking to see if somebody knew this other person, uh, trying to find the names off of a uh, Getty Images uh, piece. Um, there was a photographer who had filmed some uh, stuff for a lockdown that we uh, reached out to her about. It was from an article that she had done. Um, and it was a lot of just legwork um, and a lot of, as always, heartbreak when you're, okay, this might work. Oh, we can't clear it in time. Uh, or, you know, and of course you balance that out with the measure of success where, oh, actually this is somebody that we know that we can reach out to that is a friend of a friend of a friend. Um, and that picture is something that we can use. Um, you know, we got very lucky with the picture of the little girl balancing on the toilet hiding. Um, cause it turned out she was a very good friend of mine and best friend. <laughs> so, um, that was how we were able to get in touch with her and get permission to use that. Um, the thing that I was worried about when we were doing those reach outs is that people would be worried, um, not supportive because they'd be worried about reliving trauma or, or having their face out there. But to a person, everyone was very supportive and wanted to be part of this uh, and wanted to be part of the solution, which was really inspiring. Oh, I was going to say from an edit perspective too, one of the understanding that not only were we not going to put any un you know uncleared images in, you know, because we were trying to mitigate risk, but also like you said, Mac, everything about this piece was trying to avoid re-traumatizing this group of people. Whether the, the footage that we've included, the stills, are not just from Parkland, they're from all over the country and, you know, years back and we didn't want to re-traumatize people. So we, I remember we had several versions of the edit. We had like the ideal version of what our top, you know, what we thought the most powerful imagery was. And then we had the other version where we took out the images that weren't yet approved so we could work on replacing them. And we were constantly working so that there was never a point in which the project wouldn't, was, um, relying on one person's approval you know we, we didn't want to put that pressure on any one image or any one person and though it was hard and, and there is that heartbreak sometimes when an image you can't contact a person or you know what we think is you know an iconic image isn't usable but the truth is this is such a sad pandemic it's it's just such a problem that um you know there was unfortunately no shortage of imagery and we did get there but we were very you know very cognizant of the sensitivity and that is hard emotionally as well as it is hard from a production and edit perspective, just trying to get done. Yeah, the other, the other challenge Gab and Mac touched on how difficult it was to clear the images. We also had some challenges with finding out exactly what we could have Kaylee say. Um, we were very clear from the beginning, this wasn't just gonna be about one girl's experience in California. This had to be about America's experience. Um, so we looked kind of far and wide and spoke to um, principals and headmasters and teachers and students and parents to get an idea of what the whole country was learning at school. Um, so we took, you know, lessons that they were learning in Iowa and California and Minnesota, and we kind of created a patchwork of, of lessons that the whole country was learning. So this felt, felt like a bit of a time capsule. Um, to make it clear that wherever you are in America, this is the reality. You go to school and you are reminded almost every day that someone could walk in there with a gun, which is kind of horrendous. Um, and then March for Our Lives worked with us kind of sweating every single detail of that eventual master document of what Kaylee would say to make sure it was all accurate. And they pulled us up a couple of times. They were really clear about type of guns that we could refer to. There's a moment in the film when Kaylee says, we listen out for the types of guns. And they were really clear about, well, you can listen to this kind of gun, but you can't listen to that kind of gun. They said they get pulled up all the time by the NRA and, and other people for not knowing what they're talking about. So they work with this a lot to make sure every single detail was accurate. And when this thing launched, no one had, no one could pull it apart and say, this is wrong or this is inaccurate. Not wanting to sound too confident, but like we knew 
on the day that it was pretty powerful from the people's re real reactions. <laughs> we were kind of like, well, like we saw that and these group of people, what they just saw and how they reacted. We're just like, as long as we can cobble this into some kind of an edit, um, it's going to touch people because it's just so raw and, and moving. Um, the guys at number six, like Mac mentioned, did a great job of bringing an extra layer to it. And I think the first time that we saw the edit where they'd they'd use those kind of Kaylee saying the bang noise from the guns as like an edit point to kind of revisit, um, you know, grieving faces and 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 you know victims of 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 school shootings and stuff like in that dramatic fashion. Like this, the first time we saw that, which was honestly like the first round of edits or whatever. I thought then, I'm like, I mean, we all watched it. And, I mean, imagine having to watch this thing like 50 times, you know, it's like pretty traumatic just re-watching it. We obviously watched it a lot, but the edit was, besides the photo issue, like finding the perfect photos and clearing and all that stuff, it was like relatively okay. Um, every time we showed it to the next person, like we showed it to our bosses, they would they would have like an emotional reaction and, and pretty much have no feedback. And then we would bring in like, you know, the next kind of level at, because everyone at McCann obviously wanted to, you know, be involved in such an important project. And every time we kind of showed it to somebody, like they had no feedback. They kind of just sat there shocked and, and, and gathering their thoughts. And then I think like, the one thing I remember was, um, you know, our North American CCO, Eric Silver, came in to look at the edit and he just kind of sat there after it finished and just looked up and went, like he kind of was pretty emotionally just said, don't change a thing. And that was probably the easiest, you know, process of approval through McCann, I think, I've ever had and ever will, <laughs> will have, which <laughs> I think is uh, at that point, I think, you know, we kind of knew that it would be okay. <laughs> So the organization has the ear of, of young people in a way that I don't really think any other organization does, you know, focused on gun violence prevention or otherwise, which is great. And, and because of that, they obviously have a huge online presence. So a big barometer of this spot, um, continuing a little bit off of the last question, how did we know, how did we, you know, know it was going to be what, what it ended up being was how quickly it spread online, you know, obviously through their channels and then you know, um, current vice presidential candidate Kamala Harris even posted about it and how she wanted to make it a part of her. Um, she pretty much used it as campaign materials, which was incredible to see, as well as a bunch of other really high level politicians, um, you know, who have large, uh, very strong stances on gun violence prevention. But I think the the most special thing, at least for me as a po political science nerd, um, is that Lauren Hogg, one of the original um, and continual, um, you know, leading members of March for Our Lives, actually gave a testimony um, about perspectives on school shooting and um, security hearing on emergency emergency preparedness. Um, it was for the in front of the Committee on Homeland Security. So she actually gave a congressional testimony and used Generation Lockdown as part of the materials. So it's now on the record which is pretty cool and definitely not something that normally happens for a commercial or a spot that we work on, whether it's a PSA or, or something else. So I think that that's pretty special that they felt, you know, though we made it for them, how honored I think we all are that they, that they were so proud of it and felt that it really got the message across so well that they included it in a congressional testimony. 